Now, let us, without further ado, uh, say a very good Monday morning to Mr John Redwood, Conservative MP for Wokingham, member of the COVID Recovery Group. John, a very good morning to you. Good morning, Mike. I'm feeling quite good today, John. I mean, every Monday is a different sort of roller coaster ride for me. This particular Monday, I'm thinking we had a great weekend with England getting through to the Euro semi-finals. It looks as though Boris Johnson's finally going to say what we've been urging him to say this afternoon. Uh, what do you make of it all? Yeah, I share your optimism. The, uh, the sun has even managed to shine after <laughs> weeks of cold and rain. So maybe things are looking up, Mike. Your independent <laughs> republic always sounds great, but of course... I have to live in the monarchy of the United Kingdom and we get an awful lot of advice from our medical advisors which uh, point in the other direction to freedom. Yes. I mean, I don't know whether it was the kind of um, the, just the change in, in, in staff that was needed, but Matt Hancock leaving and Sajid Javid coming in does seem to have sort of slightly turbocharged um, Boris Johnson to go back to the opening up the economy, remembering that we're not just dealing with COVID, that we have to get all sorts of other things fixed as well. I think there's a bit of coincidence about that. I, I think you can't just simply blame Matt Hancock. Um, Matt Hancock was the voice uh, for Witty and Valance, the principal scientific and medical advisors in the government, and they've been very strongly urging prudence and caution. And that doesn't suddenly change when you get a change of Secretary of State, but I think it, it coincided with the Prime Minister in his own mind wrestling with these uh, alternative views of the world and deciding that maybe we've been prudent for long enough. And I think he has become persuaded of the crucial point that you and I and others have been making, that the vaccine seems to mean that whilst you get more cases from time to time, you don't get more serious cases and you don't get more deaths, that, that those things remain under extremely good control. It looks as if the vaccines are working. So let's enjoy that. Let's cash in on the big advance that our scientists and the NHS have made by getting people vaccinated. And let's have a normal life and get our freedoms back. Exactly right. Well, exactly, because, I mean, I was talking to people all last week in various parts of the world, including somebody who called me from Turkey, uh, who's living there, an English guy, 25 years of age, working and living in Turkey. He said, even in Turkey, he said, you can now do whatever you want. And you just think to yourself, you know, we had such a great advantage with the vaccination rollout. We were so far ahead of the rest of the world. And we've somehow allowed it to kind of, you know, f make us fall back behind everybody. Yeah, I think that there was a bit of delay that I didn't want. That was why I voted against it, of course, in the mm. House of Commons. But there were only about 50 of us who took that view. I think there are many millions in the country who take that view. And I think more millions are joining us. And what is wrong with the approach that you let people make their own decisions? So that if someone has a good reason to be very worried about their health, uh, if they don't like vaccines, whatever it may be, they can make that call and they can look after themselves and don't go to the parties and don't go to the pubs. But other people want to get on with a more normal life and they feel pretty secure because of the vaccine uh, and they accept that life is full of medical risks of kinds we can't completely control. Yes. Now, I know that this is probably not foremost in most people's minds, but I'm sure that you, you would want to see a return to Parliament of all the MPs and a return to sort of normality in the Chamber of the House of Commons. Have you heard whether or not that is coming? Well, I trust it will happen on the 19th, assuming that they do what we hope they're going to do, because it would be quite odd if Parliament wasn't really allowed to go back properly. And it's true that any MP can insist on going into Parliament at the moment, but mm. a lot of us don't because there are only 25 seats on each side and it's quite difficult getting a seat and you don't have a proper debate. Uh, and everybody has to queue and has to put in in advance. And so it doesn't make any difference whether you're on television or you're in mm. the chamber. We want to get back to a big, noisy parliament where people are uh, jostling and trying to get position and, and where you can have several hundred in when the thing is really important. Uh, and that I think we owe the public as soon as all the other controls are released. Mm. And you, John, are uh, what I would call a sort of, without wishing to be disrespectful, a veteran of, of our parliamentary democracy. You've seen many governments come and go. Are you worried, as some people are, that this government seems to kind of operate outside of Parliament quite often? They make announcements without really putting them to Parliament first. Because they've got such a big majority, they don't really take that much notice, even of backbench groups like your own. Um, can we get sort of more parliamentary democracy back, do you think? I don't think this government is particularly undemocratic. All governments like to be in charge and all governments like to manage parliament. Indeed, that's their job. You don't have coherent government unless the government knows how to manage parliament. And the reason that I and my colleagues haven't been able to do more in the direction you would like on the COVID controls is that whilst there have been uh, 
up to 50 Conservatives, enough to overturn the majority and make the government listen, the opposition parties have been with the government. Mm. So there's been an overwhelming majority in Parliament for all these controls. So, of course, we, we didn't have much power or influence. But I think now our voices have got to the government and the voices of the public have got to the government. And so it, it, it I assume, will make that democratic move towards more freedom as soon as possible. And my other concern, Sir John, is is also with, with, within sort of the way that government works, having taken all the advice that they do take and continue to take from Sage and various other advisors, I would rather like to see those people taking a bit of a step back, to be honest, and not being quite so involved in the day-to-day yeah. running uh, of, of, this, of this country. Well, I, I didn't welcome the idea that you, you gave your scientific and medical advisors, politicians' roles mm. to present the case to the public as often and as prominently as they've done. Uh, but let's make that a one-off. Our, our tradition is that the ministers have all that great advice available. They have to sit through it. They have to put it into context. They have to apply common sense. Sometimes they disagree with it. And they are then responsible both for the advice they took and for the advice they didn't take. And that is a perfectly sensible democratic system. As soon as you get advisors taking strong views on what are really political issues, like whether you and I can go to the pub or not, um, they then expose themselves to a kind of political debate which they're not equipped to do and they're not elected to do. So I think it's not a healthy development and I welcome getting back to advisers advising and politicians yes. deciding and defending. And once we do begin, as we inevitably will, to move out of this kind of, you know, paralysis of COVID, what for you are the priorities um, for this government now in terms of what they should be looking at uh, to start kind of, you know, making policy on uh, encouraging business, whatever it is? What, what, what would be your sort of top three aims? Well, for this government? I, I campaigned in the last two elections on putting prosperity first. I didn't want austerity. I wanted prosperity. So I'm looking for a major impact on the economy for recovery, more jobs, more better paid jobs, more skills. Uh, growing and making more things at home for our own purposes uh, and creating those conditions in which all parts of the country can attract investment, develop their own enterprise, have more entrepreneurs so that there are many more better paid jobs and more facilities and services on offer to the rest of us. So I, I think that's the big challenge and, and that encompasses levelling up, that encompasses build back better and all this other language they're using. But to me, it's just about the prosperity of the British people and everything we do now should be geared to giving people more prosperous and happier lives by creating the right conditions for them. And you at all worried about the debt that we've that we've sort of um, that we've found ourselves owing? No, not because uh, I think we've got away with it. I think all the main advanced countries have done the same thing. They borrowed massive amounts to try and offset the huge damage the anti-pandemic measures have found to do to the economy, and they've printed that uh, through their central banks. And we've got away with it without a major inflation, which is why you don't normally do that kind of thing. And as long as we now go back to something more like normal, um, all will be well. And I think the budget deficit will come screeching down as soon as we have a full-blooded recovery. Right. Why is the deficit so big? Well, it's because we've been giving loads of subsidies on furlough and to businesses to keep them going. They won't need that because they'll be generating money from customers. And our tax revenues have been greatly depressed because they... The companies haven't been making the profits and the people haven't been earning the, the dividends and the extra income. Uh, that will all correct quite quickly if we go for this full-throated recovery. So the deficit comes down and we will have got away with the debt, which is owed to ourselves because the, the Bank of England bought up a great deal of it. Yes. And as far as the kind of recovery goes from COVID... Are you convinced that on July the 19th, all restrictions will go? We're hoping to hear this afternoon from Boris. Um, but will we be talking about people not having to take a test if they go abroad, not have to take a test when they come back, not have to take a test to go and watch football or, or a, a Rod Stewart concert? You know, what's going to be the, the action? What, what do you think it's going to look like? Well, I want all the domestic controls to go and leave it to people's own judgment. I don't think we can guarantee getting rid of all the international travel controls because many of those will be imposed by the countries people are thinking of travelling to or be required by international airlines. I don't know whether we'll get rid of all the controls. I, I look forward to the statement as much as you do this afternoon. I'm hoping, but I dare say the, the medical and scientific advisors are also hoping that they can still keep some of the controls in place because they are very worried about getting rid of them all in, in one big bang. I think it's time to have one big bang for domestic 
situation now. I think people have had enough of it. Uh, and most people reckon that they're not now going to get a serious version of the disease. No, indeed. Let me just ask you to hold uh, your uh, horses where you are, please. So John Redwood, we're talking to uh, the Conservative MP from Wokingham, member of the COVID recovery group. John, one of the things that people raise with me all the time uh, as something that needs to be sorted out, and I know that Priti Patel talks about sorting it out an awful lot, uh, but it's the illegal immigration problem uh, of people coming here on dinghies, you know, uh, across the water from uh, Calais uh, and being sort of basically brought in by border force and then basically welcomed into the country and never to leave yeah well i think the home secretary is strongly against that uh, and she is going to take further action uh, which we will see shortly Mm. i'm very glad that she's sent very clear instructions to border force and to her other officials to say that we wish to stop this illicit trade this human trafficking and I'm very pleased that she is going to bring new legislation before the House uh, this week uh, because the courts aren't very helpful either. I think she's been very frustrated in recent months because the government's line has been clear. This trafficking must stop. We don't want people queue jumping. We don't want rich people uh, giving money to human traffickers to try and queue jump to get into our country when they aren't proper asylum seekers or refugees. And the legislation is meant to help enforce that view. Yes. The other big story, of course, is is the way that schools have been operating uh, over the course of the last year. We know, for example, now that there are something like 400,000 children and possibly more currently out of school, having been sent home because they were uh, either pinged yeah. or because they were told that somebody in their class had COVID. They've got to sort the schools out here, haven't they? Well, I think they need to look at the whole self-isolation test and trace system because I think it is throwing up far too many examples where people are advised or or required to self-isolate and we're going to end up with far too many people not able to participate in the economic recovery or not able to send their children to school and then isolating the rest of the family uh, when the risk is minimal and so I think we need a a new look at when do people have to self-isolate and how do you get out of it I mean if you if you test negative and you clearly don't have the disease why have you got to sit around for another 14 days right and, and if masks are to be uh, made, shall we say, voluntary, surely what we must also uh, ensure is that children are not forced to wear masks in school. Well, I quite agree. Um, I, I think we need to get rid of the masks most of the time in most places. I mean, as someone who is, is a member of parliament that wants to do more of my business in person, obviously I, I will ask. And if, if people meeting me want masks, then I will respect their wishes. But otherwise, I don't want to be wearing a mask. Uh, if you go to a hospital, then, of course, you need special protective equipment for dealing with patients and so forth. So we need them in the right places and where people need them for comfort. Mm. And finally, England, uh, the football team have been remarkably successful so far. Uh, they're now in the semi-finals. I've often believed that there is a kind of a beneficial effect to any government where, when, a, when a national football team does well. Um, Boris is kind of basking in their glory. I say good luck to him. Well, I agree. I think the whole nation will will be uh, mightily impressed and overjoyed if England goes on to win the trophy uh, overall, which they could now do, because I think this is a a team transformed. Mm. I I think the England team for many years has looked a bit negative and defensive. You feel they've got the whole weight of the country on their back and they're very worried about making a mistake. Suddenly we've got this amazing team full of enterprise and innovation and good ideas and wanting to get the ball forward and knowing where the goal is. Yeah. You know? right. And this incredible defence that they've got through the competition so far without a single goal and they've been up against some very good teams. And I now hear people saying, well, of course, the, UK, the Ukraine wasn't much competition. Well, it was only not much competition because the English team was abs- mm. absolutely spectacularly good. Yeah. They absolutely. just beat an extremely good team. Indeed. And if you are uh, in, a, in a position to speak to Pretty Patel between now and Wednesday, could you say to her, because I often wonder why the police get this so wrong. I don't know what the police were doing and I don't know all the circumstances, but the police appeared to be basically arresting people on Saturday night for celebrating England's win. I mean, given what's going to be happening very shortly and, and the restrictions being lifted, the police just need to back off a bit if people are partying, don't they? Well, I, I haven't seen the incidents you describe, and I think it's um, not a good idea for MPs to tell the police how to do their job. But obviously what the public want is the police to concentrate on the minority of, of fans or enthusiasts who's, who become violent against people, who start damaging property. But we don't want to get in the way, surely, of people just having a nice time and celebrating something that's been good. 
No, I think that's absolutely right. So, John Redwood, thank you very much indeed. Conservative MP for Wokingham, member of the COVID recovery group, optimist, man who would like to see, uh, as I would, the, lo- the, the lockdown being lifted, the restrictions disappearing, and all uh, of the problems that we've had just simply floating off into the ether.